a whiskey lip Cigarette smoke and a swivel hip I miss Elvis and King Creole Turn it up loud if it got some soul Got a chainsaw buzz Chainsaw buzz Welcome, folks, to another Something in the Water podcast. I'm Uncle Dave Griffin. I'm Sean Clark. And I'm Ken George. Yeah. Yeah. You see, first time we've had a Canadian, I believe, first our first Canadian on Something in the Water podcast. And uh, so we won't hold that against you. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I think I've been down here long enough. (laughs) Well, that's the thing about Ken now. Ken has been a uh, uh, semi-annual resident of Waycross, Georgia for 16 years. 16 years going on now. And uh, he's been a big uh, assistant. He, he and his uh, girl, Mary Ann Hutchison, uh, they've both been a big help at all of the festivals that we put on down here. And, uh, Ken uh, is a cigar box guitar builder. This is just one of them here. We're going to take a look at and listen to that a little bit later on in the show. But uh, he's how long you been building those now? Four years. Four years. That's all. Okay. So we're going on five, maybe. Yeah. 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 And uh, he he sells them at. Uh, the festivals as a vendor and uh, he also donates one every chance that he, every time he's down here not in canada he'll he'll donate one and we'll give it away at the raffle at the festival so but well, we're glad to have <coughs> we're glad to have you ken well thank you i'm glad to be here yeah and an uh, <laughs> he don't do just uh cigar box guitars he is a bona fide Musician, and uh, I guess you got your start that probably about the same time I did, or or maybe even before. Well, I see, like I told you, my grandfather played guitar, and I have his old Gibson, and he taught it, he made his own arrangements, and had a radio show. So, naturally, in Canada, yeah, and yeah. it got passed down. Now, we're talking back in the early 30s. Let me see that uh, catalog. Which yep. one was it that your that your granddaddy Luke, owned? Luke Gibson model. The, the Luke Gibson. That sounds like a bro country. <laughs> <laughs> he had his own Gibson signature. No, yes, he Luke, bought yeah. this one right here. The oh. Nick, the Nick Lucas model guitar. Oh wow! This is a Gibson uh, catalog from the nineteen thirties. It belonged to your granddaddy. Yeah, he'd get one once a month. And. Uh, Here's the model that he, your granddaddy owned. It was sold for ninety dollars back in uh, the '30s. It was a flat top and a back flat top and a flat back model. It was mm-hmm. the Nick Lucas model guitar. Nick Lucas was the famous crooning troubadour. That was his uh, nickname. <coughs> Excuse me, and the serial number in that guitar is handwritten. That shows you how old the label is inside. <laughs> wow. And I saw one that was advertised on eBay, eBay or something, and it was in immaculate condition, and the asking price was $60,000 for it. My God. It's a long way from ninety. No, <laughs> but then you got to figure that's ninety dollars in nineteen thirty one. Yeah, that's a lot of money back then. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That one uh, accrued value. 
It was genuine curly maple back and si- uh, back and rim, a mahogany neck, spruce top, rosewood fingerboard. Wow. And these, uh, there, there are no electric guitars in this book because it's the nineteen <coughs> thirties. No, I think the first electric, predated the uh, first electric guitar was from uh, Rickenbacker, and I think it was nineteen thirty five. Okay. And it was called a frying pan because that's exactly what the body looked like. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Was it a resonator? No, or, it was a fully was electric guitar. Fully electric, mm-hmm. yeah. I like some of these models are, uh, uh, where is it at? Uh, they call them orchestra, orchestra guitars because that's what they played in the big bands. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's still was not amplified, but they built them, these hollow bodies, the F-holes in them, where it would just project. And uh, I'm sorry, but they still couldn't hear them, I don't think. Well, I don't know if it's they were terribly... mic- with microphones back then or not. They could have been. Well, I guess they could have been, yeah. Yeah. That's a possibility. That's wild. That's pretty neat. Yeah. So, so uh, your your granddaddy gave you his passed down his box guitar to you, mm-hmm. and is that what you learned on? Mm-hmm. You kind of well, actually, he gave it to me. I did start to learn on it. Then my parents, I guess I'd be about nine, bought me a national steel lap steel guitar because my mm. mother was this big lover of Hawaiian music, and that's yeah. what my grandfather. Play. Right, right. And uh, I took that till I was about maybe 11 or 12. Yeah. And then I discovered electric guitars because now we're talking early 60s, right? And, right, right. Uh, and my mother, she just got turned right off. If I wasn't playing <laughs> Hawaiian music, she's not interested. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Actually, I could read music back then, but 60 years is a long time. And I've still got all my music. I've still got all my grandfather's music. And I'm sure if I sat down and really took the time, it would probably, you know, mm-hmm. come back to me. I got you. But, uh, so uh, where was this in Canada that you were we, growing up? Uh, I was born in Hamilton, Ontario, which is right on the end of Lake Ontario. It's about uh, 40 minutes from Toronto. Yeah. And today, you you can go from Stony Creek, Hamilton, Burlington, Oakville, Mississauga, Toronto, and it's like one long stretch. You can't tell when you've entered one town and left the next. Mm-hmm. So there's about 6 million, 7 million people there all together. Wow. I've never been up that far. I want to go, but... Yeah. Paul's been. Paul Lee's been before, and he said it's beautiful up mm-hmm. here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so in the early 60s, when you first started discovering the electric guitar, I guess what you were listening to at, t- at the time was what we were listening to basically in America. Yeah. It was pretty it much. all pretty much. And Great Britain, all of that kind of well, the, was the, simultaneous. The, the going uh, on. British invasion, it was. 64, of course, you had right. the Beatles, the Stones, the Kinks, the Yardbirds, and the mm-hmm. Animals. Uh, in Toronto in the 50s, it was primarily in Yorkville, which is uh, was the place to be. And it was mainly coffee houses like the Purple Onion or Boris's, and people like Neil Young, Bob Dylan, and uh, Joni Mitchell, they all played in these coffee houses. Mm-hmm. Well, it would be about the... 55, somewhere around there, a fella came up from Arkansas named Ronnie Hawkins, and he changed <laughs> the whole scene in Toronto. <laughs> he changed it all. Yeah. And he loved it so much, he never came back. He stayed in Toronto. He's <laughs> there to, today. Yeah. Uh, he was a rockabilly, I guess, is yep. what he, he would have he yeah. brought to Canada. His style of music was... Uh, uh, Straight out of Arkansas, yeah, where he was from. And they asked him, "Well, how uh, how much? You know, how'd you get up here?" And he said, "Well, we used an Arkansas credit card." 
Uh, what the hell is an Arkansas <laughs> credit card? Oh, it's a rubber hose about to stop. <laughs> <Sopling> <laughs> gas. Yeah, hey. Oh, goodness. And uh, uh, he ran into the band boys. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. yes, the band Robbie Robinson and that. Um, he got a lot of guys started. Awful lot of guys started. Um, and they're playing that, like, I've got some cuts here from uh, Luke and the Apostles, which was one of my favorite Toronto bands, along with the Ugly Ducklings. Mm-hmm. And uh, he influenced us all. Mm. And I come from, there was the Toronto sound, and there's what they call the Hamilton sound. And there was a lot of big bands that came out of our era, too. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they ever heard of the King Biscuit Boy down here, but he yeah. was a... Uh, well, King part- Biscuit Flower. Yep. Hour or something like that it was on the and radio. And Ronnie Hawkins gave him the name King Biscuit Boy, and he blew a heart like nobody else could ever blow. And he was from Hamilton. He was Hamilton, Ontario. And when he passed away in his home up in the mountain, word came to me, I was devastated. Mm. But he had a lot of demons, uh, uh, mm. which most of them do. You know, oh. brilliant, but at the same time, he could be on or he could be off. Mm. Depends how you caught him. Mm-hmm. But uh, like I said, and then uh, he was went with a group called Crowbar, and he played harp with them for a while. And then they went off on their own and became a big band up there. They uh, they were from Dundas, which was a suburb of Hamilton. So, like I said, the bands up there came from all over. Yeah, and uh, everybody <clears throat> had their own sound. And back then. I remember we had a big barn or industrial building that we first started <coughs> rehearsing in before we got our house. And there was all different bands uh, that had all their stuff there. We'd rehearse or they'd come and rehearse. And then sometimes a couple of guys from our band would be there and each other and have a jam session mm-hmm. in this building. But it was a very tight-knit community. There was no, no arrogance mm. then. Um, I remember one time we blew an amp, and a uh, guy I knew from another band, um, Village Stop, he said, well, here, take one of ours to get through it. It was a show that we were at, and we were one of the acts. And he said, take one of our amps. And I said, well, thank you very much. And uh, that's just how it was back then. Mm-hmm. And even the music stores were a lot like Billy Ray's. You know, you got to know the owners and that, and you could mm-hmm. go in and have a great time. And, mm-hmm. I remember one time we were in there, and uh, Mr. Haywood turned around. I was talking to these three young English fellas. And it was about 66, somewhere around there, and it was three of the yard birds. Oh, my wow. gosh. And he just locked the doors. And here we are picking up equipment for ourselves, and we're locking the store three of With the yard three birds. three of the yard birds. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a wild afternoon. Do you remember which three it was? I, Jeff Beck and oh, wow. um, Samuel Smith. Yeah. And I don't think it, it was Keith Ralph. I don't think it was. It wasn't the other uh, lead guitar player, Jimmy Page. Was Jimmy it? Page oh, he, was playing bass at that time. Oh, he, he was? Wasn't, yeah, he, he came in as a bass player. You know, let's see, that, that group spawned three of the best, Clapton, then Page, and then Beck. Yep. And, and I think Beck and Page were in there at the same time. They were. Uh, briefly. Uh, Beck yeah. was playing lead, and yeah. uh, Jimmy was playing bass. <laughs> and Jimmy sort of wormed his way up, and then Beck decided he was going to go elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> that was an exciting afternoon. Oh, it was. Yeah. It was. <laughs> so... You cross paths with, have you crossed paths with any more legends over the years up that way? Or There was, in fact, I just reconnected with her. Her name at the time was Brenda Gordon. And uh, she was one of two black students in our high school back then. And her father was Gus Gordon, who was one of the singers for the Ink Spots. Yeah. Uh-huh. And even back then, I was 15, she'd be about 14. She had a voice that was incredible, yeah, really incredible. And she went on, and uh, she got married to a fella, and now her name is Brenda Russell. And she won a Grammy Russell. for uh, co-writing the music for the uh, production of uh, The Color Purple. Oh, wow. Cool. And uh, I've got some things there. I don't know if she's performing now, or I think maybe she might 
retired it from it all. There was a lot of things one I don't know about. Yeah. Um, other people, well, Ronnie Hawkins, of course. You uh, did you cross paths with yeah, him? Yeah, yeah. Cool. He had that a bed so and breakfast cool. not too far from our cottage. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another one, I don't know if anybody down here ever heard of Ray Smith. He was a country singer, and uh, he was given a piano by Jerry G. Lewis. Oh, Jerry Lee. Okay. Yeah, and uh, his son worked with me for quite a few years. And it came to a tragic end, and uh, he actually committed suicide right in front of him. Yeah. But uh, again, how many people in the music business are have such demons? You know, yeah. drink, and well, drugs. That's true. That's a- I know Dave does. <laughs> <laughs> the only one that's not going is Keith Richards. I mean, yeah. <laughs> he's he's pretty amazing. I mean. You he, hear, he can drink his demons under the table. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> you hear so many wild stories about him all like he I've heard that he gets his uh, uh an annual blood transfusion, you know, out with the old, in with the new. You know, it's like oil change. <laughs> and uh the other thing about where a uh, uh, rumor going around that he snorted his daddy's dead ashes. <laughs> So, oh yeah, I mean, there's so got, many stories that, just, that you don't know, and some of the stuff he did with Graham Parsons. You yeah, know? yeah. Mm-hmm. I think Keith Richards surprisingly was probably uh, he, he did the least amount of drugs than than any of them. I, I, I think I read in his biography. Well, know? I don't know about that. <laughs> That's kind of hard to take, were, ain't it? They were in Toronto that. so many times during rehearsals and the RCMP busted him, or <laughs> Toronto police busted him. He had put on a performance as part of his sentencing, so he threw together a group and they played a benefit, whatever. But uh, <laughs> No, I think Keith... Uh, did an excessive amount Keith of Keith was a world class. <laughs> and they always thought Brian Jones did too much drugs. <clears throat> yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, the influence of Canada on us, on our music, uh, and your music as well, I'm sure, because you were up there and you got you got all of the, uh, the grassroots um, – Artists and everything in their formative stages, and mm-hmm. the locals and all of that. The Buckinghams, where, uh, you know, a lot of them groups. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize the Buckinghams. Yes. I mean, you could name them all. It's just five uh, man electrical band started off as yeah. st- staccatos in Ottawa, and then they changed to five man electrical band, and they took off. The they Sparrows, had the, the group, uh, yep. five man electrical band, had the hit signs, signs That's everywhere. The there's signs. Yep. Mm-hmm. And the sparrows uh, went out to California and became Steppenwolf. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> John Kay and yep. Steppenwolf. Yep. Of course, the big ones, Neil Young. I Joni was never Mitchell. a fan of him. Uh, yeah. He was too political for me. I yeah. was not, you know, no, I sort of. You were more in that uh, rock and roll. I was into the good time rock and roll. Yeah. And like I said, we used to do a lot of. When I, the band we had, we did a lot of animals. We did a lot of stones, some yard birds. And as a progress, we did it with Alice Cooper. Uh, stuff that was suitable for my voice. Because mm. I had, even back then, my voice was very limited. I couldn't go and do a Freddie Mercury song or anything like that. Forget yeah. that. Mm-hmm. But You, you uh, wasn't a pretty, per, you didn't sing pretty. No. I sang. Sang, well, I have some cuts there where we sang pretty. And then, of course, these are rehearsal ones, so they weren't the finished product. Yeah. Um, but we had a good time. Uh, uh, it was a good run. Yeah. It was a good run. Um, we played well, Hamilton, Oakville. We never got to Toronto. Oakville was as close as we got, but we had a lot of fans that would follow us around. Mm-hmm. Hit the different bars. What, what was the band name? The band name was Stonehenge. Stonehenge. Yep. Yeah. See what we got on there. And that, uh, I think pi- you might pictures. find, if you took the pictures, you might find a... Uh, the black and white was the actual poster that we put in the different hotels. And then mm-hmm. uh, our lead guitar player got artsy a few years back and said, this is what it should have been. And he sent the one with the Stonehenge behind it, all five of us. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, we're... Uh, that sounds like a hard rock band. It uh, does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it reminds you of... Uh, 
Uh, it should be uh, labeled uh, with words rather than numbers. Well, that was from my movie era. Yeah, we'll get into them <laughs> in a little bit. But, uh, go down to Duo, I think it's the first one. Yeah. So this is... Uh, there it is right there in the second row, I think, the front wall. That was another uh, musician. That was my uh, ex's uncle, and he had a band in Newfoundland called the Draggermen. The what? The Draggermen. Draggermen. These are guys that would go into the mines when there's been a, a blowout or whatever and rescue the miners that were in there. Wow. Okay. And his, that was the name of his band? Yep. Okay. I think they put out two LPs down there in Newfoundland. And that's you over there. That's this, me in the back there with my echo guitar that I showed Judging by the shirt and everything, this looks like early 70s. This would be, uh, no, it would be about 70, 78 or so. 78 yeah. or so, okay. Yeah. Rocking the polyester. Yep. There you go. <laughs> now, before, before this, well before this, you had Stonehenge. Yeah, the Stonehenge started off forming in 1969 and finally came to fruitation probably around 71 mm -hmm. when we finally got the people that all fit. Mm -hmm. And uh, That takes a while to do, don't it? Oh, it Sometimes. does. It does. Well, let's see there. Uh but Scott still sings today. Now, Scott's going to be about 75. And there's the poster there on the second row at the front. Right, Leather. Right there. That's oh, it. that one. Yeah. Now, uh, that's the band. Stonehenge. That's you. On bottom. Bottom. Bass player, Matt, is on the left. Guitar player, Roy, is on the right. Harold, who also played drums for the Fifth Dimension, was a drummer. Which one is he? He's the fellow on the left. On the top left? Yep. Okay. And then Igor was our lead guitar player. Okay. Cool. So it was funny. The very first time when the five of us finally got together and played in public was in a little town. It was a college town, Kitchener, and it was a place called the Choo Choo Stop. Now, I don't think you ever heard of the Copper Penny down here. I don't think they made it this far. Yeah, but uh, we were told to bring the guys to bring their axes because there was a matinee show going on. Well, we get there and then it turns around, they're having a band contest. So they had all these different bands going up there and playing, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, these guys are good, and these guys are great. And Harold up there is saying, No, they're not. No, they're not. I said, Yeah, they're great. So I think we were the last ones that went up. <laughs> We took home first place and took home a hundred dollar cash prize. <laughs> Heck yeah! <laughs> Which in seventy one it was you know yeah. nice little bit of change, mm -hmm. and that's the one that he created. And I said, I wish you could have done that with the Stonehenge from yeah. England in the back of it. I said that would have made an outstanding you know poster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. This is in our house when we finally were able to get a house. The fellow in the, the jacket on the right, he used to do a lot of photography for us. Mm -hmm. And then the fellow hidden by the microphone is our lead guitar player. Matt was the youngest of us. We were all in our 20s. Matt was 18. And here's our bass player, and I can see Harold sitting down there in the corner. So that's not you standing in the middle? No. Okay, I thought, no. that, was, I thought that was you. No. Slingerland drums. Yep. I got drunk one night when we were rehearsing and drinking Southern Comfort, and I passed out. My head went right in his bass drum, and that's where I laid. <laughs> well, most drummers put a pillow in there. There was a pillow in <laughs> there. Dead. Dead. <laughs> so, of course. <laughs> that's the place to pass out. Yeah. Until it's time to wake up and somebody's playing the drums. So, oh, yeah, somebody <laughs> there was, on, it, yeah. on the foot pedal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get up. Man. That was the times back then. That would be about, say, 71, 72, mm -hmm. back in that time. We went until 74, 74, 75, 75 maybe, middle of 75. And then it just, what happened was we were offered a gig for a month out on the, the East Coast. 
and it was going to be $15,000 for the month, which back in those days was a good mm-hmm. piece of change. Mm-hmm. Plus, they were paying our expenses to go down and our accommodations. Heck yeah. Well, we had a Yoko Ono in the group that was Igor's uh, wife, girlfriend. She said, you're not going. Oh. Of course, when you take out a person that you work with and he's got, you just can't pull in a replacement and go off, you know? So yeah. that sort of curtailed it for a while. She said, I don't mind you playing where you can come home every night, but you're not going out traveling. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what would have happened? Should have, could have, would have. Yeah. Well, you were ending about the time I was beginning in uh, my traveling band escapades. We started up in 75, October 75, and it went for three years and nonstop of just all over the place. It was an education, though, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Life on the road. I got a question for you. What's the worst place you ever played? Worst place. I'm not talking about uh, the audience. I'm talking about the building and whatever yeah. accommodations they presented with you. What was the worst one you were ever at? <laughs> well, no, gone. Uh, there's uh, one place that comes to mind is because uh, nobody was there, and we had driven all night long from Nashville, Tennessee to Savannah, and uh, we had to play that night and. The Nashville gig ended on a Sunday night, and we had to play in Savannah on Monday night. So it just we just took speed and jumped behind the wheel and drove all night. And when we got there, we loaded in and set up, and then we went back to the motel and pulled the curtains, got the room real dark, and uh, slept all day. And... Uh, when we got out there to that little club, it was a little low-slung dive bar, uh, pool tables, and barefoot waitresses with dirty feet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were just breaking away from our lead singer, Eddie Middleton, and so we we didn't have our song list together yet. So we kept playing this one song over and over that night. It was a... Uh, Tavares, it was an old uh, disco song from called Heaven Must Be Missing an Angel <laughs> from 1977. And uh, <laughs> that was pretty bad. That was a brutal night. And John, uh, our drummer, was, uh, was quitting drinking all at the same time. And it was just, I remember raw nerves and uh, just wore out, wore slap out. <laughs> From road road travel and uh, it's just uh, not a good vibe. I guess that's one of the worst ones. Yeah, I remember the worst one we were in. We were in. A, it was actually north of Toronto. It was one of these little towns where there's a corner store, a gas station, and a bar across the street, and that's downtown. So we went. I don't even know how we got the booking there, but we went in. They had rooms for. Five of us. Well, the the rooms when we went up consisted of a bed, no box spring. It was one of those old cross wire things where when you sat on it, you went right in the middle. (laughs) The the lighting in the place was a cord hanging down with a light bulb over it and a pole chain. (laughs) And one night table. And the bathroom was down at the end of the hall. Oh, my God. And then when you turn the light on and you heard all the critters come out. <laughs> Got to be the worst place I ever, ever played that. What about you? Yeah, I'm, Sean. I'm sitting here thinking. I can think of a few uh, for different reasons. Yeah. But as far as like just a dive place. That played at this place called the Power Line out in West Georgia. I can't, can't even remember where. Like kind of 45 minutes south of uh, Albany. I can't, 
But uh, out it was in the it was it what the the building wasn't that bad. It was out in the country. It was just like we were not welcome there. Like, <laughs> they didn't care what we were doing. They just wanted us to quit. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Just wanted them out and how we got in and got out. Yeah. You know, um, it's, it's amazing too how you you attract a certain crowd to a bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, one night you could have say a real bluesy band. I remember her one band in uh, Oakville. We were on the top floor; they were on the bottom floor. And I swear to God, it was ZZ Top playing at the bottom. They oh, were yeah. that good. Oh man! They had one crowd in. Yeah. We were hard rockers. We had another crowd. And in the middle was a disc jockey playing disco. He had no crowd. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> yeah, we had a disc jockey. Uh, well, many of the places we played between 75 and 78 had DJs. But we had one down in Panama City at the Sheraton on the beach. It was named Disco Mike. And, uh, and that old son of a bitch, he, he would get to uh, – he would start playing our set list, you know, on the breaks. That's, and, uh, That's bad. He it made uh, Eddie Middleton pretty mad. So we got in what right at the end, our last night there, one of the engagements. We uh, we pied him in the face with. Uh, the kitchen was right behind the <laughs> dance floor. <laughs> we came running out of the kitchen with a big old whipped cream pie and uh he totally didn't see it coming (laughs) that was fun well i look back in the days and i think we made money but it was more the energy you got that you fed off the crowd Mm -hmm. if the crowd was with you you fed off that energy Mm -hmm. it made you even go more Mm-hmm. I think, you know, you, the two of you were some of the crowds that you played at. And that, I mean, I see some of them people out at the festival and some of the bands that come up. Uh, Page Brothers, for example. I love the Page mm-hmm. Brothers. I love their music. Um, but you can see the crowd getting into it. And mm-hmm. I think that they were feeding off the yeah, crowd. Yeah, that definitely you know. helps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that'll take it to a whole nother. You can play the same song and not mess up. But if somebody's getting into it, it's just going to be that much better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's going to have more energy to it. Just, uh, but I sort of miss that because, like I've told you before, I come down here and I hear the bands in that place. To me, it's like a time warp. Mm-hmm. Because I'm hearing down here is what I heard Toronto and Hamlet we were doing back in the really? late 60s, early 70s. That's fine. And I missed it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I really missed it. Which is why coming back down here is such a trip for me when I get to hear you guys play and yeah. and then the other bands in that play. Now, I have to admit, there are some bands I've heard at Swamp Fest and that, that were not really my kind of band, but then I've heard others like, oh, wow, these guys are great. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. And uh, I really got into a lot of them when they were playing, and it's just, it's just a rush. It's funny that you mentioned that because uh, Larry Murray came out from uh, – California a couple of years ago at the last guitar pool in 2019, and he said the same thing. He said he he related to his you know background uh, coming up in California in uh, the uh, mid 60s, you know, mm-hmm. where he had this blue guitar music store out there, and it attracted youngsters like. Uh, Chris Hillman of the Birds and uh, mm-hmm. Bernie Ledden of the Eagles and all, they would get, they would get in the music store and just jam, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of the first early bands that they were in, you know, uh, he said when he came to the guitar pool three years ago, he said it reminded him of, of that, you know. It's just a, a very uh, rootsy. Just going back to the basics. Yeah, going back to the basic, the yeah. roots and everything, yeah. and the the the, the community, yeah. the camaraderie and everything. Yeah. 
it, it reminded him of that. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I noticed that at the festival. When, yeah. when one band's finished and they start interacting with the next act or mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. Like I said, this is how it was for us back in the 60s. Mm-hmm. We helped each other out. Mm-hmm. In fact, our real good start happened with uh, uh, one band that was playing at a hotel called, called the Omar. And uh bass player was friends with, I think, Igor's girlfriend or whatever. Anyways, they told us, well, come on down Friday night and you guys can play the third set. I said, okay, no problem. Well, we come down and then they played the first set and they played the second set. I said, okay, you guys are up for the third set. So we went up. And we had a small list that we know would cover a set time. And we started playing and... Um, me, I'm cra- I was crazy. I was crazy on stage. Uh, between every set, I had to go and dry my hair out because it was soaking wet. <laughs> Change outfits because it was soaking wet. And people thought I was on drugs all the time. <laughs> so we went up and played it, and we did a bunch of Stone songs. We did uh, Brown Sugar, and we did uh, Carol, yeah. Chuck Berry, yeah. Sympathy for the Devil, and, and a couple of others. I can't remember uh, now, but then we finished. And the guys were a little bit jealous because the crowd was getting into us. And I had one drunk girl when we were leaving, and she says, I want Mick Jagger back, God damn it. <laughs> I mean, she was, she was gone. <laughs> but uh, You must have done a good impression. <laughs> well, you know who I got influenced by was Ronnie Hawkins. Yeah. Because he, he was a he, wild man in the young days. Man. Didn't uh, he do flips off the piano and stuff? Oh, God, he was crazy. Um, Ronnie Hawkins, and another one was uh, first Southern band I got into was Black Oak, Arkansas. And I oh saw boy, Jim yeah, Simmons, I Jim Dandy Mangrum, mm-hmm. and I watched him on stage, and, and he was another wild man. Mm-hmm. And of course, you throw in Mick, and you throw in other, and you just mix it all together. But I was my own person; I wasn't imitating Mick Jagger, but because we're doing so many Stone songs, because that's what everybody in the audience was calling for. It was sort of a nickname that was thrown at me. Mm-hmm. But uh, the owner of the bar, after he heard us do that one set, he came over and, uh, can you guys play in two weeks' time? Yeah, sure. And that's how we started getting gigs is because other bands would let us do a set and bar owners would hear us, see the reaction of the crowd. Bam, we get hired. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess you you did uh, – you could have made a lot of enemies that way too. You pissed off some of the well, bands, huh? <laughs> but they were, all, you, yeah, yeah you, but you y'all, could have, but y'all had think, the community. But I think when you think back at it, uh, we appreciated it, and we told them. I mean, if yeah. they did get, didn't matter. So, you know, guys, we really appreciate. It you. didn't stop them from getting bookings. No, it was just no. more to go around. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot. There was 165 bars in Toronto alone at the time. Good God that had live bands playing, mm-hmm. and Hamilton had about 40 because it's a lot smaller town. Burlington, How big was Hamilton? Hamilton at that time would have been about 400,000. Good God almighty, that's the big town. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then there was a couple of places where we played in Burlington and, uh, you know, I said Oakville, Riverside, we recall back, I think, about five times because the bar owner loved us because we were a band. We always started every night off with uh, brown sugar and as soon as the crowd heard those opening chords they were up dancing yeah well, of course you know the bar owners are going to love that because they're dancing they're getting thirsty mm-hmm. and they're drinking mm-hmm. that's the that's the formula yeah mm-hmm. yeah so 40 clubs in hamilton four hundred thousand population i'm sure all of that wasn't drinking age but uh yes that's uh, just right off the crunch the raw numbers that's 40,000 people per club <laughs> that, you could, that you could fit in there. <laughs> Basically. And in, in, in Toronto, like I said, that was the bar. It didn't include coffee houses and everything else. You know, yeah. So many, because we had well over a million people there. So how was, you said, uh, so the British invasion that hit America also hit Canada. Oh, it hit, it Canada. hit worldwide. It hit Canada. The Beatles hit wide whole, whole wide world. And that influenced y'all uh, some? Or? It influenced some. Now, like I say, Luke and the Apostles, they were more of a blues-oriented band. So I would say they were 
maybe had more from the animals or the yard, which was more blues-oriented, blues, yeah. or even the yeah. early stones, which were mm -hmm. blues-oriented. Yeah, blues yeah. um, Did so, you like the Beatles? Me? Yeah. I was never a big fan, yeah. but I will admit that I really think the most talented one of the four was George Harrison. Okay. I mm -hmm. really liked George Harrison. Of course, look when he went into Traveling Wilburys. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. I, I had... To me, he was the most talented of them all. I, I I felt close to George myself right there from the beginning, you know. Uh, I guess hi, hi, historically, uh, Lennon McCartney had the majority of the songs, songwriting, and and mm -hmm. and really put forth change among uh you know yeah. they they brought on the changes in music you know and uh george was just kind of floating along on their coattails until he caught up to their speed you know mm -hmm. which was before the beatles were finished uh, he was right up there he could put out a song just as good as they could you know yeah but well um, the stones were sort of the same way yeah. okay when they started out they were a cover band they went mm -hmm. back to blues roots and of course, Brian, he he created the band. He picked them all and gave mm -hmm. the name and all. Got the early bookings. Of course, he was he was not a nice man. Mm -hmm. I have to admit, he was not a nice man. Brian Jones. Yeah, no. He he was so talented he could play thirty five instruments, mm -hmm. but he had a lot of demons. Fragile. He was very fragile. fragile yeah. Very fragile. But um, <clears throat> same thing. When they were on stage before Mick and Keith took over, mm -hmm. all the girls were screaming for Brian. Mm -hmm. No matter what Mick mm -hmm. was doing on stage, the girls were still after Brian. And I think he was a little bit miffed about that, you know, because, yeah. hey, I'm the front man. You should be after me. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> but then, you know, it's like things change. Mm -hmm. uh, but so many of the groups there did have influences. Uh, one of my favorite groups from them was the Moody Blues. Oh, uh, man, me too. Moody Blues Moody had Blues. such powerful music. Yeah. And, you know, everybody goes on all oh, about uh, Freddie Mercury and all that. I'm sorry, the Moody Blues, yeah. uh, Tuesday afternoon, nice and white satin. No songs Justin just, Hayward. Justin Hayward, yep. Yeah, he was. Mike Pinder. Yeah, Mike Pinder, too. Yep. Yeah. Oh, God. I, th those were the two main songwriters that grabbed my attention in the Moody yep. Blues. My brother turned me on to them. Uh, he was uh, three years older than me and always – had a, a lot more vision than I did as far as music went. And uh, I was still in high school when he went into the Air Force and he got stationed over in Cornwall, England, mm -hmm. <laughs> home of our good friend Ian Dunlop. And uh, before he left, I took over the payments on his Volkswagen van <laughs> And he left a bunch of albums with me, some of which were Moody Blues, some of those early albums Days of uh, to our past. children's children's yeah. children. And, uh, oh, man. And that was where I, I dipped my toe in the water of, of prog rock. Uh, oh, it was so good. I just latched on to that. And then I started buying their stuff as it came out. Uh, mm -hmm. Question of Balance. Uh Every good boy deserves favor, and then Seventh Soldier, and it's kind of where I ended the. You remember their first song? Huh? The very very the first song they first had song it? on uh, ever. Yep, first song. First uh, was 45. Go Now. What's that? Go Now. Yep. Uh, that was pre Justin Hayward. Mm -hmm. That was uh, Denny Lane was mm -hmm. the guitar player and the singer. Yep, the lead singer on that song. I always call it Go Nad. <laughs> go Ned, go Ned, go Ned. <laughs> well, it's like a stoner listening to them playing Hey Jude, and he's going, Hey Dude. <laughs> Don't get so mad. <laughs> oh, well, see, so you were influenced by a lot of people that I was influenced yeah. by, too. Like, I had a wide range. I enjoyed the Kinks. I mean, yeah. you know, oh, Ray yeah. Davies oh, yeah. was, was a brilliant oh, songwriter. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jerry Marsden. Jerry and the Pacemakers. Jerry and the Pacemakers. Yeah. They, in fact, they finally put a, a, a memorial plaque up for him back in Liverpool. He just passed away yep. recently. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It was certainly a time to be young and. Well, I look at it this way. You're sort of pigeonholed now, but going back to beginning of the British invasion, say, until the mid-70s, you had the birds, which started off as a folk group. Mm -hmm. You had Steppenwolf. So you had folk rock. You had folk music. You had hard rock. You had acid rock, Jefferson Airplane. Then Mm -hmm. you had uh, ones going for the blues, going back like the Beatles and and the Stones Mm -hmm. and and them, because that's where they got their start from, Eric Clapton. That's mm-hmm. why he quit the Yardbirds, because the Yardbirds were progressing, and he wanted them to stay blues. Yeah. <laughs> so he left. But there yeah. were so many different genres back then that you, you could go to. Yeah. Paul Revere and the Raiders, I thought they were great, mm-hmm. you know? I don't know if you ever heard of them down here. You, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't were, know. There's so many bands mm-hmm. that, <clears throat> that were sort of district bands, and they were great here, and everybody loved them. But mm-hmm. over here, they never heard of them, mm-hmm. yeah. you know? Uh, and it's a shame. That's mm-hmm. like I said, if you people back in the 60s and 70s heard what we had coming out of <laughs> Toronto back then, you, yeah. you would have been blown away. I didn't realize the Buckinghams were from there. You know what's funny is— The Buckinghams were from New Jersey, I believe. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I thought that they were Canadian. No, the Staccatos, a uh, five-man electrical band was Canadian. I Chilliwack got you. is another one, I think. Chilliwack, I remember them, yeah. Now, I had the oldie station, 107-1 on down here. Uh I forget, I was going for somewhere, and then I heard this song, and it was called The Last Song. It was Edward Bear. Edward Bear, yeah. And I thought, who the hell ever heard of Edward Bear down here? Oh, yeah, that was a big hit. I I nearly punched the singer one night because he was trying to pick up my girlfriend, and I nearly (laughs) did. Oh, yeah. So you you punched Edward Bear? I almost did, but but, but (laughs) Helen wouldn't let me. Well, that was one of the old songs that I used to listen to on the radio in the early 70s. It's the last song yeah. I'll ever sing for you. Yeah. Very mm, yeah, yeah, folk, it, it, uh, it was kind of, kind of syrupy. You know, syrupy yeah. ballad um, um, David Clayton Thomas, I David saw David Clayton that. Thomas, yeah, another he Canadian. Was, uh, yeah. He played at a dance where the admission was a buck. So I yeah. went in. You know who that is? Blood, Lead sweat, singer and for Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Huh? That yeah. band, that old band. Yeah. Uh so I can say that's another one whose path yeah. I crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Gordon Lightfoot. Gordy Lightfoot. Big uh, folkster. I went and, down to uh, St. Augustine and heard the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald coming out of a bar down there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, he was very, very ill for a while. <clears throat> In fact, didn't think he was ever going to make it. The Guess Who was a big influence on me. I loved the Guess oh. Who. Burton Cummings. And Burton Cummings. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, Bachman Turner. Bachman Turner. Was uh, a spinoff from that. Yep. How about Dominique Troiano? Dominic Troiano was big. He was a Toronto boy. Okay. And he was really big in there. Uh, when Joe Walsh left the James Gang in mm, probably 72, 73, he slid in along with another guitar player. They had a lead and a rhythm guitar player slid in to make the trio a quartet. And recorded one album with the James Gang there. And uh, uh, I thought he was from Canada, yeah. Dominic uh, Troyan? Yeah. yeah. He's from Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. Another one that came from Toronto who uh, was absolutely, he blew Stevie Ray Vaughan away with his playing ability. Now, if you're going to blow Stevie Ray Vaughan away, you better be good. And that was Jeff Healy. Jeff Healy. Oh, my That's gosh. Yeah. 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 No, he was born uh, a year old. He had cancer of the eyes, and they actually had to remove his eyes at the age of one. Oh, my gosh. So so he got it, that natural thing growing up with the full, all the other senses being huge. I, I, I just yeah. admired his, the way he mm-hmm. played guitar mm-hmm. on his lap. But uh, he was playing. I saw a video of him and Stevie Ray Vaughan playing together. And, mm-hmm. and they're playing, of course, Stevie Ray Vaughan is a great guitar player, oh, yeah. right? He's one of the, one of the top. Mm-hmm. But he just turned over and watched Jeff play. And he was, you could see his face. It was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> he was blown <laughs> away. And uh, Jeff was a really good jazz player. And uh 
even though he mostly played, was known for blues, mm-hmm. but could play. He owned a bar. He could play really complicated. He uh, owned a bar in Toronto so. for several years, mm-hmm. and he'd be there occasionally. I mean, it wasn't one where he played at all the time, but he'd be there, and people come in, and, you know, just to see him, and it was great. It was, but he, again, another one had passed away at a very young age. It was mm-hmm. cancer that finally killed him. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. like I said, there is. Uh, Rick James was from Canada. He was from Toronto. Really? Yeah. yeah. He and Neil Young had a band. For a short while, it was kind of like a doo-wop band or something like that. <laughs> what was that name of that band called? I, it was I another even, bird. I, it was another the minor, minor bird. bird. Yeah, the minor, yeah, minor bird. bird. In fact, there was one of the bars <laughs> in Toronto. And Rick James. <laughs> wow. Yeah, one of the bars in Toronto was called the Minor Bird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm Neil Young, bitch. <laughs> I'm Neil Young, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't it Neil Young that did old man? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know we did it for a bit, but when we played Old Man, we threw our own spin on it, and it sounded more like Black Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> hey. Well, let's take a short break, folks. When we come back, we will crank this uh, uh, cigar box guitar up and let y'all hear what it sounds like. Can't none of us play it except for Ken. Uh, not for Ken <laughs> here. You know what? <laughs> I told you I but, haven't touched uh, one month. We might uh we might turn uh Justin Mercer loose on it. Mm. And uh we'll see what we'll see what else is shaking with our good buddy Ken George. Y'all come on back. Something in my brain won't let me stray. Something in my veins gonna find its way. Something in the water taught me how. Well, we're back with Ken George, our guest this time on Something in the Water. And uh, this is one of the cigar box guitars that this talented musician and guitar maker from Canada is, is spends his spare time doing right now. And uh, it's a beauty. So we're going to give it a, a run through here. And uh, here's an old blues song that I, that I wrote uh, here a while back talking about some true things that happened to me in my life. It's called a chainsaw buzz. Got a chainsaw buzz done mess me up Drinking hard liquor from a wooden cup Tall pine tree gonna ride it down Lay flat black and the prize on the ground Got a chainsaw buzz Chainsaw buzz Yeah Got a chainsaw buzz done mess my mind Raising up ghosts that I left behind Ain't no love ever set me free From all these devils inside of me Got a chainsaw buzz Chainsaw buzz I got a chainsaw buzz Chainsaw Chainsaw buzz, chainsaw buzz, yeah. Mm. Got a chainsaw buzz and a blister thumb, bang on my Martin like a big bass drum. Yeah, let it get round the south, 
Turn up loud if you got some sass Got a chainsaw buzz Chainsaw buzz I got a chainsaw buzz A chainsaw buzz That's nasty. That's that. That's just nasty. <laughs> I wasn't sure where I was going with. Well, folks, that's that's the sound that a cigar box, uh, three strings on that thing is open tuning uh, the key of G, yep. key of G open tuning, which is the basis of many, many, many blues songs over the years. But just three strings on this little jewel, and that's uh. That's what our man right here does. <laughs> it's yeah, good stuff. Ma makes plenty of them. <laughs> now, you got uh, this one along with a left-handed version. Yeah, I do. Promised out to a couple of customers back in Canada, and you're leaving uh, the 1st of May, 2022. Uh, we're leaving around the 5th of May, yeah. The 5th of May headed, uh, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, he's a... He's a He's a transient. He he comes down. He's, he's like them snowbirds. I'm an illegal alien. <laughs> he's like an ill eagle. <laughs> but we love it. We love it. Love to have him down here when he comes down. It's always good. Well, I'm always happy to be down here. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to wind this up with a... Uh, a tale of the week. And this one happens to be in the book. It's just that uh, I'm going to read it off the paper since I printed it out. So I made a few edits. This one is entitled Spud, Duck, and Donnie Mac, A Brief Education in College and Chicken Coops. From my uh, uh, award-winning <laughs> tales of the week <laughs> from Dog Hill to Tripoli and back. I, I think I've got a few copies of this left at home. It's kind of like the Newfangler's CD. I got a bunch of copies in boxes at, at home and uh, and very few sell if they do. <laughs> we'll say, I reckon I always knew deep down inside what I was going to do with my life. I just had to cull through the chaff to get to the wheat. So upon high school graduation, I lit out to Statesboro, home of Georgia Southern College in September of 1971. I aced my 2.30 p.m. algebra course, suffered through several weeks of biology with Dr. Cornelia Hyde, who, when she spoke, little pockets of white spit formed in the corners of her lips. Biology up close and personal. I used to have to watch that. Slept through art and life in a big auditorium and passed P.E. with flying colors, even though I never got up to make the 8 a.m. class. My high school buddy, Robin King, shared a room with me in Oxford Hall, located just off the main campus. A long walk to what felt like the countryside with a fenced-in clover pasture right in front of the dormitory, where I sat and got high one night with a bespectacled Afro-haired Jewish kid whose name I've forgotten. Several more of my Ware County High classmates made their way to Georgia Southern, but I hardly ever ran into any of them unless we carpooled to, a, to and from Waycross on the weekend. The next step in education, college, opened the door to new friendships with students from across the state. Spud, Duck, and Stan were all Oxford Hall <laughs> dorm mates from Noonan, Georgia. Characters as colorful as their names. They loved drinking, smoking, and cussing, all the finer aspects of college life. Bob Smith, graduate of Oconee County High in Watkinsville, became a good friend for a few months. 
driving home with me one weekend to take a Friday night, uh, take in a Friday night Ware County Gator football game and a Saturday night Chicago concert in the old Jacksonville Coliseum. We lost track of one another until a few years ago when I was visiting my son Connor, who was then a student at the University of Georgia in Athens. Connor, a fine musician and songwriter himself, invited me and his mama to a daytime recording session at Full Moon Studios in Watkinsville, where he was laying down tracks for an upcoming album. I started reminiscing with the owner of the studio, Jay Rogers, about an old college friend from Watkinsville. After all these years, all I could remember was his first name, Bob, and I think I thought I'd heard or read somewhere that he was in real estate. Jay says, there's a Robert Smith at Oconee Properties right across the street from the studio. Really? What? I remember Bob being quite a conversationalist back in the day. And I have to say, 46 years later, he's still good at it. <laughs> we talked about grandkids, life, and politics. For about 15 years, he was the state legislator in the Georgia House of Representatives. Bob Smith, a good, kind, 64-year-old humanitarian. He's more like 68-year-old now. Looks like Dick Van Dyke. He was uh, back in back in college now. Uh, you take a lot of poundage off the face, and uh, the hair was not as wiry. It was a little more uh, uh, wavy and and blonde, and uh, he wore uh, Buddy Holly glasses, uh, little black rim glasses. <laughs> he was, and he had his face was white. You could see, uh, you could see the uh, uh, his cheeks were flushed after a a, a, a good laugh or a, a beer or two. Yeah, he's a good fellow. We had some good times way back when. So there was Bob. Yeah, I hooked back up with him. While avoiding academics during my fall quarter at Georgia Southern, I continued to study my passion for music. The college hosted several concerts at the Hanner Fieldhouse, the building where I didn't show up for P.E. I saw the Jay Giles Band. Everybody remembers them. Yep. Wet Willie from uh, Alabama. They actually uh, were another one of Capricorn uh, label <coughs> out of uh, Macon, Georgia, one of their big acts, Wet Willie. Mountain with Leslie West on guitar. Mm -hmm. Awesome band. And Eric Quincy Tate band, which featured a drummer who sat in a ladder back chair and played, it, played drums in pointed toe cowboy boots. That would have been him on the far left there. His name was uh, Donnie McCormick. Donnie McCormick. Mm-hmm. And uh, years later, he would perform with Ross Peed at several of uh, my Grand Parsons guitar pools in Waycross, beating and kicking on a funky homemade chicken coop. There it is right there, adorned with ram horns, animal bones, and cowbell. That was a, uh, that was a sight to see, Man, too, I, folks. Um, it was something. That was a Awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. Sadly, he lost his battle with cancer and passed away in January 2009. Oh, Donnie. The night Wet Willie played at Georgia Southern, I was early to arrive and found a tall, long-haired dude in a black duster carrying a bass guitar case looking lost. I pointed him to the right door, and minutes later, I saw him on stage with Wet Willie. Turns out he was Jack Hall, brother of Jimmy Hall, the lead singer, harmonica blower, and saxophonist who wound up playing at the guitar pool in 2006 with the Capricorn Rhythm Section. And that there behind him on guitar is Tommy Talton. And uh, on keyboards, we had Paul Hornsby, um, 
Johnny Sandlin on bass. Uh, the other guitar player was uh, um, Tommy Talton and Scott Boyer. And on drums was uh, a fellow who played with uh, Cowboy. So it was truly a Capricorn alumni there that night. Mountain was an American rock group who played Woodstock with Cream producer Felix Papillardi on bass and drummer N.D. Smart, who went on to, in 1973, to tour with Graham Parsons' group, The Fallen Angels. That's him kneeling on the ground in front of the bus next to Emmy Lou there. N.D. Smart, he, before, before Graham hired him for uh, The Fallen Angels, he had been in a band, and before Mountain, he had been in a band with Barry Tashin called The Remains. They opened up for the Beatles uh, during their first leg of an American tour. So he got to play alongside some, some pretty great folks. Following Woodstock, N.D. Smart was replaced by Canadian drummer Corky Lang. You remember that name? Mm-hmm. Corky Lang, drummer from Mountain. He was uh, uh, performed on the legendary 1970 album Climbing, Mountain Climbing, containing Mountain's signature hit, Mississippi Queen. Some people end up with diplomas on their wall, degrees to be admired, and alumni memberships that gain them discount admission to Georgia Southern Eagle football games. I reckon I always knew deep down inside that wouldn't be me. <coughs> so there it is. I, br- I, I tried to break the Canadian influence into it. <laughs> and I... Uh, Wound up finding it in the drummer for Mountain. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, see, I always thought Mountain was a Canadian band. Yeah? Huh? I always thought Mountain was a Canadian band. Yeah. Well, Leslie uh, Leslie West was from New York, I believe. Uh, and Felix Papillardi was uh, probably New York, too, with that name, Italian. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was producer for Eric Clapton and Cream. Oh, okay. And also the bass player for Mountain. Um, Rush. There's another Neil Canadian Pert. connection. <laughs> Neil Peart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They've actually, uh, they're going to put a monument, not a monument like a statue or that, but a... A marker. A marker. In Saint uh, Saint Kitts, for Neil, because that was the area that he actually came from. And what was uh, what town was that? Saint in? Catharines is just uh, it's going towards Niagara Falls. Okay. So it's between Niagara Falls and Hamilton. Like I said, all our bands they came from all over. It wasn't just mm-hmm. from one spot. You ever been to Niagara Falls? Too many times. <laughs> <laughs> now, Marianne always says she loves the Canadian side, but she does not like the American side. American side, they say, it's just like a border town. Oh, yeah? All the attractions are on the Canadian side. Oh. Uh, but you can get to Niagara Falls from either side, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Niagara Falls is actually... On the American side, and then it's what they call the Horseshoe Falls. When you see the falls with all that tons of water coming down, that's the Horseshoe Falls. Niagara Falls, it's a falls, but it's not the same lake. A lot more subdued? That's, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Buffalo, right? Buffalo, New York. That's mm-hmm. the American side? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that just seems like uh, a big, uh, um, what do they call them things that uh, – Automatic sinkhole. <laughs> it mm-hmm. reminds me of a huge sinkhole. <laughs> I call it tourist trap myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, that's no, a you, sinkhole. It's the only for place you. where you can buy a three dollar souvenir and be charged fifteen dollars. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Sink your money into it and watch yeah. it go down the hole. There you go. <laughs> All the people that's gone over the falls and the um, bucket. 
buckets <laughs> and <laughs> barrels. Barrel, yeah. Yeah, some people actually survive. I worked with a guy named what is Larry, that a, uh, Larry Mundy. His brother is not allowed in Niagara Falls. He's gone over the falls in a barrel three times. Oh, wow. In fact, he's he's in one of the, uh, I think it's the Guinness Book of Records. Oh, um, Ripley's Believe It or Not. <laughs> and he had specially made barrels, but he went three times. And Larry actually looked like his brother, and he got stopped going to Niagara Falls with his wife saying, no, you're not allowed in this town. And he had to really prove that he wasn't his brother. <laughs> you're the guy. Yeah. The guy's brother. The guy's, yeah, you're the guy's brother. You probably made the barrel. <laughs> hey, and and that's and that's something that uh, people do illegally or yeah. is it, it's, it's yeah. not a, it's not. The a, only one that was an accident was around 1960, early 60s and a, a young boy went over. Uh, a boat capsized. His sister made it to shore. The <clears throat> adult was in the boat. I believe he drowned, and the boy went over the falls and survived just having a life jacket. Wow. Mm. Yeah. I bet you that was a terrifying drop. Oh, I, I think so, too. Oh, man. So that was a, a boat before it gets to the falls. Yeah, it was would in have the been making with- its turn to go back and just. Sure. It was on the Niagara River on the American side. Oh, man. Yeah. Honeymooners love it, though, right? Oh, yeah. There's all kinds of honeymoon hotels. There's a lot of nice bed and breakfast places along the the, the road following the river, too. And then you go a little bit further, you come to a place called Niagara on the Lake. And uh, the Shaw Festival, big theater, that's where people like Christopher Plummer, um performed on stage Shakespearean mm-hmm. acting and mm-hmm. old Captain Kirk you know he was another one <laughs> who's on there and then you have the wine country we have some of the best wines in the world in that that area yeah. and uh, it's beautiful it's a beautiful mm-hmm. area to go and see um, everybody comes across from the states and they said we just love it here because it's so clean uh, but yeah it's because we got a bunch of guys at night picking all the litter yeah. <laughs> Well, we certainly have enjoyed having you, buddy. Mm-hmm. And well, uh, I I really appreciate being here. Yes, sir. It's, it. it's been a it's been a educational. As for me, if finally yeah. seen somebody knows how to play this, these guitars that I make, because it <laughs> yeah. sure is. I don't me. know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was just hoping to land in the right spot. <laughs> well, we uh, uh, hope that you'll. Uh, have us up to Canada. Maybe we'll bring the cameras up to Canada sometime and do a do a uh, uh, something in the water podcast from Niagara Falls or something. They don't like when you come up there. From here. Like, Damn Americans! <laughs> oh no! no. <laughs> like we're uh, we're about two hours north there. We're, we're actually we're pretty much in the country. The nearest town for us is a little town called Fergus, a Scottish settlement, yeah. and it's sixteen thousand people. So you feel right at home, like you'd be in Lake and Wake. <laughs> right. The only thing is, in downtown Fergus, every store is open. <laughs> <laughs> Fergus. Yeah. Well, folks, we appreciate y'all watching this time, and uh, I'd like to thank our our guest Ken George. From Canada slash Waycross. <laughs> and Waycross, uh, Canada. From Waycross, Canada. <laughs> 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 and we hope that y'all uh, come back again. Well, if you have me. Hey.